that I'm doing by uh, Death and the Maiden by Ariel Dorfman. Uh, more specifically, the focus of my presentation is going to be on the analysis of music as it occurs throughout the play. And I'll be talking about some of the implications that that music gives, as well as some of the effects that that music has on the text. So without further ado, the use of music. Death and the Maiden. It's the title of the play. It's also a piece of music that occurs three times throughout the course of the play. Now, any time that an author, or in this case, playwright, takes a play, writes it, names the play after a piece of music, and then sticks that piece of music in the play three different times, you know it's got to be important. And that's part of the reason that I decided to analyze music throughout the play. Music in general occurs four times in the play. In the beginning, we've got Death and the Maiden, the first movie by Franz Schubert, written in 1824. The second piece of music that occurs is the second mo movement of Death and the Maiden, also by Franz Schubert. The third piece of music we have is kind of a stray from this pattern of Death and the Maiden, and that's Mozart's String Quartet No. 19 in C major, his Dissonance Quartet. And then finally, to make a nice big sandwich, we have the, la the first movement of Death and the Maiden reoccurring. Now, for a play that's only 68 pages, that's a lot of music. That's four different large pieces of music. Each one's around half an hour long. And so, because there isn't as much text, having that much music really affects what the text does and how it reacts and, and how it uh, works with the different characters. So now, why would somebody choose to put that much music into a play? Well, to kind of explain one of the basic things, I want everybody to just close your eyes, empty your head, and for a second, think about every movie you've ever seen. All right, you probably have a lot of different titles flying into your head. Some of you are thinking comedy, some of you are thinking horror, some of you are thinking romance, some of you are thinking about movies I can't talk about in school. <laughs> now, think about one of those movies that doesn't have music. You probably can't think of any because music is in almost everything that we watch on TV. Well, why is that? It's because music acts as an, a mood enhancer, and that's something that many reputable sources agree upon. Um, Mayo Clinic, the Minneapolis Institute of Mental Health, a lot of reputable sources agree that music acts as a mood enhancer. And by that I don't mean that, you know, you listen to music and you're like, hey, I'm a happy guy now. I mean that whatever, whatever mood you're feeling or whatever mood that the music reflects, it's going to further that. It's going to take it as a kind of a pole and it's going to bring that to an extreme. So sad music will reflect a sad mood, happy music, happy moods, romantic music, romantic moods, etc., etc. Uh, likewise, in this play, one of, the one of the points of having music is to take the moods that are expressed, some of the, the nuances throughout the play, the sad feelings, and to really make those even more sad, to make them even more in-depth. And so that's just one of the things that music does. Uh, to kind of better explain this, I prepared a short little video clip that has the same footage that occurs three different times, but under each footage, under each uh, reoccurrence of that footage, I put a different soundtrack to show how changing the music can completely change the meaning and the implications of the video. So, can you make a play, Zach? Down the bottom left. All right. <laughs> serious topics involving torture, rape, and some other stuff. And so it wouldn't make sense for Ariel Dorfman to put in music like Barney or the Simpsons theme song. And so as a result, we wind up with things like Death and the Maid. Now the first scene where we have music is it's a scene where Pauline has just tied Roberto to a chair. And she's walking around him with this pistol, and she's kind of insinuating some things about Roberto and talking about some of the things that he supposedly did to her. And then she begins to talk about Schubert and how that was the worst of all, that he played Schubert. And so, 
just to show you kind of how music can influence and deepen the mood, I've prepared a kind of cut up clip of from the play, and I'm going to play the music while I read it. And just think about, well, how does that make the mood more intense? Schubert anywhere I go, any Schubert at all. Strange, isn't it? When he's still my favorite composer. I think I was on the verge of throwing my whole Schubert collection out. Crazy. And so by adding this music, you can pause it, by adding this music, we get a variety of emotions that are deepened. Uh, emotions such as sadness, fear, most of all intensity. It, it intensifies the relationship between Paulina and Roberto, and it makes that relationship almost electric. Um, aside from this, it also creates a bridge for Paulina into her past as it begins to open up the wounds of some of these things that happened to her that she really hasn't talked too much about for a long time. So the next uh, music that we have is the second movement of Death and the Maiden that occurs 37 pages later. But before I get into that, I'd just like to point out that Death and the Maiden, the quartet that we hear a lot, was inspired by a song written by Schubert five years earlier. And this song talks about a maiden who's begging Death to pass her by because she's too young and she has a whole life to live. She's innocent. And then Death, here he says, you know, give me your hand, you beautiful and tender form. I am a friend and come not to punish. And he promises her that she'll sleep softly in his arms. So I've got a clip of that music too. Can you? Thanks. And I think it's interesting that the inspiration for the music in the play comes from lyrics like this, which kind of fit with the plot in that Paulina used to be this innocent person who was going to college to be a doctor. She wanted to help people. But then all this bad stuff happened to her, and now she's kind of being tormented by this insanity that's brooding in her mind. And the insanity is almost begging at her. It's almost whispering, you know, just slip into this form of insanity and things will get easier. I apologize. I'm the same notes, all the ones on an orchestra and one's piano and vocal. So, all right. Death and the Maiden, the second movement. One of its qualities is it's known as kind of a death march, a dirge, something that will be played at a funeral. And when you look at its qualities and where it's being played, it kind of creates this death march-like walk into the truth. Uh, a little better explanation is Paulina is sitting there and she's beginning to confess to her husband Gerardo about all the things that happened to her in the past. And she sits down and she begins to record her confession into this tape. And then the lights dim and all that we have are the glow, the flicker from the cassette recorder. And then Roberto's voice takes over and he begins to justify some of the things that he did. And explain, you know, I was just trying to be a good guy by keeping these people alive, but then I got power hungry. And so once again, what we get is kind of a death march-like walk into the truth. A somber, uh, slow pace as what happened is revealed. And so Dorfman would have chosen this music likely because of the message it can get conveyed through the former lyrics and because of its walking death, mar death march-like qualities. And then the third movement we get... Oh yeah, yeah let's get that. The third movement that we get is Mozart's Dissonance Quartet. Now this is the third piece of the play and it's also the only one not from Death and the Maiden. So why would Dorfman decide to take a piece that's not like any of the others and put it in? Well, most likely because it has some sort of special significance. So I began to look at this, and I began to hear the dissonance. And then I looked at what was happening in the play at the time. 
This occurs right after the big climax of the play where Pauline is about to shoot Roberto. And you know, there's this big face-off between the two where he's like, you know, I'm innocent, you don't deserve to do this, don't shoot me. And she's like, well, where does it end? Why don't I get justice? And so as that happens, the lights fade, and out on stage comes a mirror. And the audience sees themselves reflected in this mirror. And at the same time, there's a spot that passes over the crowd, and it, it picks out two or three people at a time. Now the audience, hearing the dissonance in this music, begins to feel a bit of cognitive dissonance. They look inwards, and they think things like, well, you know, what's happening to Paulina here is a really bad thing. But I couldn't be capable of something like that, could I? I mean, I could never do something like that. Maybe my neighbors, maybe the guy highlighted by that spotlight over there, but not me. But in the same sense, we're all complicit in that, do we ever really do anything to stop the evils around us? We don't, and because of that, we're all bystanders, and in that sense, we are guilty of perpetuating them. So, let's play. So listen to the, the clash of the notes in the beginning, and think about how seeing yourself as this is happening, and being highlighted by a spotlight, would kind of create that mental image of almost inward guilt. repetition of the first movement of Death and the Maiden. Now why would Dorfman decide to take a piece that he's already smacked in the beginning of his play and repeat it at the end? Well, it kind of all ties together. What's happening is Paulina is, you know, some people think she's gone insane and that she killed Roberto, some think that she's finally accepted what's happened and she's able to listen to Schubert again. But I don't really think what happened matters because, like a song, you don't listen to it for the end of the song, you don't listen for the last note. You listen for the chords and the, the progressions in the middle of the song and how it all flows together. And I think that's similar to the stories. It doesn't really matter what happened to Roberto in the end. It's the journey that got there, the morals that are instilled within that play, and, and then some of the implications that are delivered along the way. Um, and in a sense, too, the combination of these three pieces creates a story within the story. The first play we have that kind of, or the first piece of music we have that kind of bridge to the past. The second one, we have that steady march into the truth as Polina and Roberto begin to confess things. The third piece of music, Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, kind of casts some of that guilt onto the audience. And then finally, the last piece is kind of tying it all together by, by showing that, well, what happens? We don't really know. And so in that sense, it completes the story. And so the lights go down while the music plays and plays and plays. And then the curtain falls, and that's all we're left with.